Hi, welcome to our channel of IGNU Audiobooks. Indira Gandhi National Open University, School of Continuing Education, Bachelor's Degree Program, Elective Course, Rural Development, BRDE 101 Rural Development, Indian Context, Block 3 Nature and Process of Development, Unit 5 Rural Credit, Microfinance, Self-Help Groups. 5.1 Introduction The rural sector accounts for 71% of the total population of the country while it contributes approximately 21% of the gross domestic productivity of the country. The economy of the rural sector comprises of essentially the primary goods production i.e., agricultural and handicraft products. The society of the rural sector comprises of the farm owners, farm laborers, rural artisans, village level service givers, small businessmen, transporters etc. In this era of globalization cereal oriented subsistence cultivation is giving way to market oriented non cereal cultivation practices. The significance of credit provisioning has increased manifolds, since agriculture now cannot be left upon the mercy of rain god and soil mother. The alternative to these uncertainly ridden phenomena is in the realm of technology, the purchase of which requires adequate finances and timely provisioning i.e., before the onset of the agricultural cropping seasons such as Kharif and Rabi. Sir Frederick Nicholson in 1895 noted in the report on land and agricultural banks in Presidency of Madras, lessons of the history are that an essential part of agriculture is credit. Neither the condition of the country, nor the nature of land tenure, nor the position of agriculture affects the one fact, that the agriculturist must borrow, the issue therefore of rural credit cannot be overemphasized. 5.2 Rural Credit System in India The rural credit system in India can be broadly divided into two categories, namely i. Unorganized sector 2. Urga underscoreized sector the I-1 e unorganized sector comprises of the informal channels of credit provisioning in the rural regions, they have been known to exist from the times when agricultural produce began to be marketed, in fact till 1954 the share of this sector in the credit structure of rural India was to the tune of 94%. The importance of this sector is now however declining due to the various legislative measures besides decentralization and democratization of credit sources in the rural Arjuns, on accounts of the unjust usury practices, of loan recovery by the various exponents of the category. The unorganized sector has two segments the professional, consisting of the indigenous bankers like Multanish, Patanis, Shroffs, Chaitiyars and other similar money lenders. Besides Nadis or trusts, while the other is the non-professional segment, which includes landlords, merchants, mowaris and agriculturists etc. This sector is singularly Notorious for its high rates of interest besides other usury practices that act highly detrimental to the interest of the borrowers, the only redeeming feature being its ubiquitous nature of occurrence in the countryside and its readiness to give credit, even for non-productive requirements of the rural peasantry, thus its appeal and consequent popularity. The organized sector of the rural credit system in India consists of a large number of financial institutions participating at different levels, viz. The primary agricultural credit societies, rural branches of commercial banks, regional R colon underscore rural banks and land development banks etc. operating at the grassroots level, the central cooperative bank the commercial bank with one of them designated as the lead district bank at the district level, the apex cooperative bank at the state level and underscore at the national level capping this structure is the National Bank for Agricultural and Rural Development, NABARD under the overall direction of the Reserve Bank of India. 5.2.1 Objectives of the Bank for Rural Development 1. To give financial assistance to small and marginal farmers for increasing their productivity through innovative techniques of cultivation, irrigation, fertilization etc. 2. To give financial support to the rural artisans by way of promoting Nira 1 industrialization. 3. To help rural beneficiaries to form self supporting financial institutions such as cooperative credit societies. 4. To financially aid groups and organizations who are working for the welfare of the rural sector. V. 
to adopt certain villages to create the demonstration effect for improving the conditions of rural habitants by providing basic amenities and appropriate technologies. The following diagram suggests the structure of rural credit servicing in India. Look at the screen for diagram content. The organized sector of the commercial bank category including the Reserve Bank of India has been of a recent origin. The commercial banking in India was established by a British agency named Alexander and Company in 1770 for the requirements of the British trading community in Calcutta, and was called the Bank of Hindustan. In 1935 this Bank of Hindustan was renamed as the Reserve Bank of India, to outline the credit policies, coordinate and centralize the banking structure in India. The function essentially till independence was to regulate the commercial lending activity of the commercial banks in the country. Check your progress 1. 1. What types of loans are considered productive? 2. What are unproductive loans? 5.3 Rural Credit Structure The Agriculture Credit, under Section 54 of the Reserve Bank of India Act 1935, stipulates the establishment of the Agricultural Credit Department, that was instrumental in the conduct of survey studies in 1936 and 1937, to gauge the nature of the rural credit available and the character of the rural credit requirements, consequently a variety of initiatives were taken to reinvigorate the cooperative credit movement that gradually evolved into a full-fledged cooperative credit structure with two separate setups one for short-term and the other for long-term credit provisioning, with complete financial accommodation at the national level. This concern continued till the independence of the country. The All India Rural Credit Survey undertaken by the Reserve Bank of India in 1954 clearly brought out the limitations and consequent failure of the cooperatives in channeling credit to the rural peasantry and farmers alike was awarded with the observation that cooperatives have failed but cooperation must succeed. The credit movement was launched with the primary objective of releasing the rural poor from the clutches of the money lenders, landlords, traders etc. and the credit provisioning of this underprivileged section for productive assets so that they may be able to break out of the vicious cycle of poverty which had engulfed the entire rural peasantry. Today the hold of the money lending classes is still immense though it is steadily declining. The Rural Credit Survey Committees estimated that in 1951-52 the unorganized sector provided 93.6% of the total credit supplied in rural area, in 1961-62 this figure had come down to 81% and by 197J, 72 it had receded to below 60% by the 1990-91 decade. The figure of rural credit supply of this sector amounted to 54% and the cooperative credit FL. FL.O could not step into the role of rural financer as had been envisaged. It remained a problem on account of 1. The cooperative leadership and management being in the hands of big farmers. 2. Land ownership being a dominant criterion of admission to membership and extension of credit. 3. Lack of technical expertise and operational efficiency. The Rural Credit Survey Committee of 1954 had recommended an integrated rural credit structure based on three fundamental principles, i. State partnership at different levels, 2. Full C0 ordination between credit and the economic activities especially marketing and processing, and 3. An administrative setup with adequately trained personnel, responsive to the needs of rural population. Incorporating these principles the cooperative credit structure evolved into a federal character with the primary agricultural coop. Credit societies at the grassroots level, the central cooperative banks at the district level and the apex cooperatives banks at the state level. These credit institutions thus supplied finances, supervised its utilization, recovered dues from members, functioning as balancing factors at each level and supplementing their financial resources through deposits, borrowings from the public money market and the Reserve Bank of India. Nevertheless the persisting inadequacy of rural credit promoted the formation of the Agricultural Refinance and Development Commission in 1963 to provide funds for refinancing of the cooperative sector followed by the establishment of the All India Rural Credit Review Committee in 1966 to review the supply of rural credit in the context of fourth five-year plan in general and the requirements of intensive programs of agricultural production in different parts of the country in particular, 
the 1965-67 drought focused concentrated attention upon agricultural alternatives of which the Green Revolution was one. This necessitated the adequate availability of credit in certain parts of the country, calling upon the various commercial banks to play a complementary role alongside of the cooperatives in extending rural credit, supplemented by a spate of bank nationalizations in 1969 followed up again in 1980, to underscore the imperative of financing certain neglected areas including agriculture, the concept of primary sector approach in lending credit was so introduced and in 336 districts of the country the lead district bank scheme had been introduced on the recommendation of the organizational framework for implementation of social objectives, at the behest of the National Credit Council. This schemes was highly praised area approach to rural credit with the following objectives. I, to open up banking facilities in unbanked areas of the district maintaining a population level of 17,000 people per bank. Two, to emphasize upon credit provisioning for the weaker sections of the society. 3. To mobilize deposits in favor of unbanked areas and for unbanked people. 4. To coordinate between government authorities and banking institutions at the district level for credit provisioning. V. To integrate credit and banking services with the socio-economic thrust of the policies of the government. The other important function of these lead district banks are providing for state and of fertilizers etc., working capital requirements for cooperative marketing and processing societies. Interim finance to cooperative sugar factories. Support to farmers service societies and primary agriculture credit societies at the district level. Such lead district banks have adopted villages throughout the rural sector of Tifauri country for IRDP programs on a pilot basis. For example the SPI alone has adopted 350 villages, with the primary aim of meeting the socio-economic developmental needs of the adopted villages under the schemes for the targeted population. The differential interest rates for the low and requirements of this section has also been applied, so that they may be relieved from the money lending classes in the rural sectors. A case in point needs amplification here that in the interest of beneficiaries of economically and socially backward classes of the rural sector the following steps have been taken by these lead district banks. For a loan amount of up to Rs 5000 slash no security or third party guarantees to be insisted upon. For the village artisan or village slash cottage industry loan amount of Rs 25000 slash security. Guarantee or margin money requirement is not to be insisted upon slash. The branch managers have been vested with the discretionary powers to clear 80% of the proposals referred to them for the sake of rural development. Thus an attempt to remove the credit gaps in spatial and sectorial distribution in rural India for e first time had been made effectively with some success. However the inadequacy of rural credit flow continued despite the above measures and initiatives resulting in the formation of a committee on rural banks headed by N. Nasimhan, who proposed a new system of public sector banks in rural areas that were to be characterized by a combination of local familiarity of the cooperative societies with the ability to mobilize the resources and organizational acumen of the commercial banks, thus the regional rural bank came into being, with the primary objective of I, provisioning of credit and other bank facilities to small and marginal fanners, landless laborers, artisans, rural entrepreneurs as target population in their designated areas. 2. Credit catering to the productive processes in the rural region of their designated area. 3. To cultivate banking habits amongst weaker section of the population in their designated area. This specific service area approach along with the target population was perhaps the main cause of its dismal record. Nevertheless the record of the number of battles in unbanked and underbanked areas, is so impressive, that by the end of 1985, 183 regional rural banks had 10,245 branches in 322 districts of the country with deposits exceeding 960 crore and advances up to 1,081 crore. Therefore as graphic card, committee to receive arrangements for institutional credit for agriculture and rural development suggested, that financial viability cannot be the sole criterion for evaluating the performance of RRBS, so judged on the basis of objective fulfillment, the track record of these regional rural banks has been impressive, vis-a-vis. -vis. I, 
credit needs of the small borrowers. 2. Banking habits cultivation for the weaker sections. Thus crystallized the multi-agency approach for rural credit flow which again gave birth to problems regarding the efficient dispersal of credit, identified by a working group which are as follows. I. Uncoordinated manner of retailing credit in a common area of operation resulting in multiple financing, overfinancing, and other similar financial indiscipline. 2. Avoidable waste of expenditure due to needless competition among the various rural credit agencies. 3. Problem of loan recovery because of credit agencies being placed in juxtaposition by the borrower. 4. Diverse procedure between banking institutions at the grassroots leads to problems in the sphere of a. Timeliness of the credit assistances. B. Sanctioning borrowing powers. C. Security norms. D. Service and performance charges. E. Recovery performance and procedures. However, a major development in the area of rural credit was the setting up of the National Bank for Agricultural and Rural Development, NABARD, in 1982 created out of the merger of a part of Agricultural Credit Department and the Agricultural Refinance and Development Corporation of the Reserve Bank of India, on the recommendation of the Committee to Review Arrangement for Institutional Credit for Agricultural and Rural Bank Development, CRAFACARD, conceived as an exercise in decentralization of AIRBAY.I. Functions in the Sphere of Rural Credit the functions of this apex national institution are credited with all matters concerning policy, planning and operations in the area of rural credit for agriculture and allied economic activities in rural areas. The scope of this apex institution covers the i. provisioning of refinance and credit for the promotion of agriculture, small-scale cottage and village industries in rural areas. 2. Granting of loans and advances to state cooperative banks not exceeding 7 years for short-term loans and 25 years for long-term loans, so, as to enable them to share directly or indirectly the capital of cooperative credit societies. 3. Development of policy and plans, their operationalization, coordination, monitoring, research and training besides offering consultancy services in rural credit. 4. Undertaking the inspection for the state-slash-central-slash-primary cooperative setups as well as the regional rural banks. v. Provisioning of funds for the promotion of research in agriculture and rural development. v. Production and marketing activities of artisans and other rural craftsmen. 7. Provide investment for not only minor irrigation works but also for activities for promoting agricultural and rural industrial development. This apex institution also operates in association with the World Bank groups of projects that have now started playing a vital role in the sphere of rural development. Today the World Bank is the single largest source of external fund, financing the various rural upliftment programs in the country based on the assumption that people in rural areas experience poverty due to i. overpopulation, 2. limited resources, 3 primitive technology that this can be redeemed if the limited resources and labor can be mobilized, poverty can be reduced and standard of living can be improved in the rural areas. These assumptions provide, either necessary assistance for starting development projects at the rural levels in the country. This assistance from the World Bank is channelized through the central and state governments to the panchayats for effecting rural upliftment. You are listening to this check your progress to 1. Complete the following depiction of rural credit institutions at various levels. National level, state level, district level, village level. 2. Mention the structure of the cooperative banks. 3. What are the causes of failure of the regional rural banks? 4. What are the purposes of the NABARD? 5.4 Concept OF Microfinance Microfinance is the provisioning of credit and financial services of small quantity to the poor and needy. It is improving the access of the rural poor to financial institutions for typical financial services such as depositing savings, loan borrowing, insurance, transferring of money and equity transfer, which may be classified into primary and secondary services. Primary services pertain to the aspect of deposit savings, credit, insurance, and money transfer while the secondary services consist of the enterprise credit, pension, leasing, 
equity transfer etc. The microfinance services therefore are not different from the regular financial services in their content aspect, though the difference exists in the aspect of scale of operation and direction of delivery, flowing from the connotation micro, scale-wise meaning small amount of money and direction-wise meaning economically and socially deprived sections of the society, for small people as commonly called. The need for primary credit services arise out of the internal demand that essentially contribute to the process of aviation of poverty while the secondary credit services are the product of external societal perception requiring non-financial support such as capacity building, forward and backward linkages, MAT attempt to take initiatives against poverty through growth processes. The primary credit services therefore through reduction of personal costs give ascendancy to the inclusionary processes that must be achieved for succeeding in the growth processes generated by the secondary credit services. Credit provisioning for financial institutions of any scale is essentially the product of the demand and supply aspect of capital. The demand factors being determined by i. Credit services availability. 2. Respect for that credit service. 3. Effective utilization of that service's resources. While the supply factors includes 1. Capital. 2. Regulation and supervision. 3. Delivery models. 4. Sustainability and adjustability to market conditions. Lay in the sphere of microfinance, the logistic imperative is capital, though its small quantity is no barrier, however, its quantity does determine the size of business level and scale of technology utilized along with the aspect of propensity to save and the level of credit absorption rate. But this shortcoming is overcome by the nature of microfinance service being, of a doorstep service provider along with the characteristics of compassion, cooperation and utmost transparency in transactions is inbuilt in the microfinance activity, to counter the negative effects of free playing of market forces upon the microfinance institution, the tools of efficient information system, effective regulation and supervision and high quality assurance are but ample guarantees of sustenance and rural development. Very significant changes are taking place in the rural sector. There are incipient signs of a much closer connection between the primary producers, trade intermediaries and food processing entities, that have become the new growth centers of the rural regions, characterized by a high degree of heterogeneity unlike in the era of cereal production. Today there exists a myriad of product varieties concentrated in certain areas for the market under vastly differing marketing conditions with equally varying input requirements. These new growth centers are essentially the product of diversification of the agricultural base from subsistence-oriented cereal production to non-cereal market-oriented cash crop production with emphasis upon the aspects of storage, transportation, processing and retailing thereby strengthening the linkage between agricultural diversification and rural industrialization. This has spawned the development of a new marketing approach of direct marketing as opposed to government-regulated wholesale markets that provided hardly any assistance to the farmers in marketing. This new system not only smoothens out raw material delivery to the agro-processing units but also assists the farmers and rural artisans as well as rural entrepreneurs to get maximum benefit and thereby profit enhancement results in the raising up of the rural standard of living. The new development mantra is microfinance aided by the political ideology of the Panchayati Raj in rural areas, it has brought about this transformation, it is therefore the primary remedy for the ills of the rural sector's credit flows. 5.5 Microfinance and Self-Help Groups The need for an alternative credit system was long felt for, the ultra-rural poor and various experiments in credit management had taken shape through government initiatives and the activities of non-governmental organizations. A case in point, could be the Self-Employed Women's Associations, SEWA Bank in 1974, followed by the Mysore Resettlement and Development Agency, Merada, and Mohammed Yunus's Gradmin Group model the forerunner for which had been the Credit Management Group, CMG, in point 1970, in the background of today's self-help groups, SHG for rural development, in realm of providing financial services to the rural poor.
This provided the base for Nabard to launch a pilot project to experiment with 500 SHGs in 1992. The Reserve Bank of India constituted a working group to study this experiment in 1994, and in 1996 issued a circular that fostered credit linkage between informal SHGs and the banks. This proved to be a landmark policy decision in the area of microfinance in rural development. Another such innovation was the introduction of the Kisan credit card policy that encouraged banks to lend short-term loans against land security to cater to the credit needs of the landed gentry in rural areas. 5.5.1 What are SHG? They are small groups of people facing similar levels of economic and social deprivation, who come together to solve their poverty-ridden problems by uniting their efforts and pooling in their resources I. Finances, henceforth to be turn one ed as common fund. From this common fund the members of the group can draw small loans. This, common fund, of a group of people preferably not less than 10 and not more than 20 members can be deposited in a bank by opening an account of the group after taking a decision to this effect in a meeting attended by all the members. Thereafter a gestation period of six months of trouble-free operation of the group's account to convince the bank of the confide credentials of the group's members, the bank may consider for credit linkage of the group's common fund with the bank's resources, depending upon the quantum of the common fund. This is the loan to the self-help group and it may be used by the group to enhance its intra-group loaning activity, for any purpose deemed fit by the self-help group. The members of the group are to realize that like their savings, the bank loan to their group is also their money and that the group as a whole commits repayment of the loan to the bank. It is group psychology upon which the credit linkage scheme bases its operation, as it fan up moral pressure upon the borrowing members for loan repayment on account of which the loan repayment ratio is cent percent. The goodwill between the members of the group and the bank's authorities is sustained in a symbiotic manner. The demonstration effect thus generated acts like a catalytic force in forging business opportunities with banks' credits resulting in the UN presidential growth of SHGs in rural areas. From the bank's viewpoint lending to SHGs not only fulfills social commitment of the banks but also it means investing in good business opportunities in the priority sector. The NABARD gives cent percent refinance to the bank's lending loan. The self-help group comprise of 10 to 20 families with each family being represented by O.NA member, which is either only men or only women members. But the most imperative requirement of an SHG is, that its constituent members should be from the same social and financial background, so as to foster problem-free interaction amongst members. Another criterion is that the members should belong to those households who depend upon the money lender for their daily needs and have a per capita income of less than 250 per month and owning not more than 2.5 acres of unirrigated land. There are other qualifying common living conditions for the recognition of the group as self-help group for credit linkage, such as i. Pagka houses of the members. 2. No access to safe drinking water. 3. No sanitary latrine. 4. Must be having less than full meals a day. v. Presence of more children than adults in the family. v. Presence of an alcoholic member or prolonged illness of a member in the family. 7 should belong to either the scheduled caste or scheduled tribe. Out of these seven common living conditions, at least four must be satisfied by the member households for the group's recognition beside regular weekly meetings with compulsory attendance of all the members along with regular maintenance of, and updating of, all the registers such as membership, meetings minutes, savings and loan register. All these must be updated during the course of the meetings so as to make the proceedings transparent. To create an atmosphere of trust, faith and confidence amongst even the illiterate members. The major functions of the self-help group is, promoting savings and thrift. The amount concerned may be small but it should be a continuous and regular habit with all the members, to cultivate the habit of self-dependency along with financial discipline, gained through the collection of small savings and the disbursement of internal fund lending amongst members for an interest rate to be fixed by members of the group to foster a combined approach for tackling the social and economic weaknesses of the group.
The loans lent by the bank to the common saving fund is to be used for lending amongst members as decided by the members in their meetings, the SHGs are required to authorize at least three members out of which any two are required to operate the account of the SHGs, who would also be interested in maintaining the record of accounts and other books in a simple and clear procedure understandable by all the members, the banks usually sanction a loan amount of four times the amount held in the common fund which may be set aside at the discretion of the branch manager. The purposes for which loans can be lent vary from the production-oriented requirements to social and pathological requirements viz. purchase of economic assets, marriage, birth, death, hospital and health requirements etc. but only after the discussion in the self-help group meetings has occurred and taken note of. So, to an extent very limited though care of the credit needs of the poorest of rural poor seems to have been taken at least theoretically. Check your progress 3. 1. What is meant by microfinance institution? 2. What is SHG? For what section of the rural segment is it meant for? 3. What are the main functions slash purpose of SHGs? 5.6 Performance and Limitations a review of the literature on rural credit in India reveals that the overall credit flow in the rural sector emanates from two sources, the non-institutional sources dominated by money lending categories and the institutional sources, dominated by cooperative banks and societies, commercial banks and regional rural banks etc. Though institutional credit has increased over the years several gaps exist in between to buttress their supplementary role, though in a decreasing occurrence. According to the All India Debit and Investment Survey, 2002, the relative share of institutional agencies in the total cash debt of rural cultivators increased from 7.3% in 1951, to 31.7% in 1971, to 63.2% in 1981 and 66.3% in 1991 to 61.1% in 2002. A perusal of the following data would conclusively highlight the observations made above. Table 5.1, Relative Share of Borrowing of Cultivator Household in Percent Look at the screen for table content. Of late however a slight increase in the incidence of non-institutional credit source has been registered, which has been supported by the finding of National Sample Dash Survey Organizations around in 2002 indicative of the fact that debit borrowing from the money lender category that could have translated into the sinking in of various stages of social pathology prevalent in some of the rural areas such as Widab, Telangana etc. Nevertheless institutional credit has increased over the years taking almost 50 years. Since 1930 to kickstart a change by 1980, through a spate of bank nationalizations, are followed by legislative allocation of top priority sector to agriculture and al one eyed rural industries, institutionalizing the lead district bank scheme and a subsequent expansion of the regional rural bank network across the country. All this eventually resulted in popularization of institutional credit sources as a better alternative to the sources of informal non-institutional credit. Now therefore the performance of the institutional credit sources needs to seen in his context, of the role of various credit sources down the decades. Table 5.2, Institutional Credit, Share of Total in Percent Look at the screen for table content. The reversion in the incidence of share percentage of the cooperative sector since 1970 till 2002 to 2004, similarly stagnation of the rural regional banks at 8.7% since the last three years might be enough to indicate the loss of clientele to the money lenders, which registered an increase of 8.9. This in itself fixings out the serious limitations of these two sources of institutional credit, therefore it is clear that institutional credit agencies such as the ones mentioned above have not been able to fill in the existing gap in credit flow to the rural areas. A marginal change in the thought process of the policy makers ushered in the era of microfinance in the rural areas. This pattern of rural credit has been, to an extent successful in bridging the credit gaps for the lowest rung of the rural society. The extent of achievement can be gauged by the fact that, the target set for credit linkages of self-help groups over exceeds the limit each year, in 2003 04 the limit of 1.85 self-help groups turned to register 3.47 lakh SHGs, with refinance aggregating to 1,006 crore, being provided by the NABARD, 
in that year against a target of 705.44 crore, while for 2,405 credit linkage had been extended to cover another 2,16,051 SHGs, thereby the credit linked SHGs cumulative strength rose from 10,79,091 on March 2004 to 14,26,354 SHGs. In March 2004 with cumulative bank loan disbursement and refinance support aggregating to 5,674 crore and 3,130 crore respectively. The number of poverty-stricken families benefiting through these credit-linked SHGs increased from 1.67 crores to 2.14 crores for the corresponding period. Approximately over 90% of the SHGs were all women-membered groups. Based on the success of these SHG which was specifically for the SC and ST classes, the rural credit aspect witnessed the extension of similar schemes for the non-priority segment elements, such as the joint liability groups, to cater for the credit requirement of the middle segment clients dominated by ten ant farmers, oral lessees, sharecroppers, besides small and marginal farmers. This scheme is its the pilot project stage and has been introduced only in seven states through eight agencies Viz Bihar, Karnataka AA, Madhya Pradesh, Kerala, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, and West Bengal. Similarly another project called the Farmers Club has been launched and nearly 11,000 Farmers Clubs by March 2004 had been sponsored by NABAR throughout the country, aimed at generating self-sufficiency of the middle segment farming community exclusively. Another 5,000 such clubs were to be sponsored the following year, with the support of regional rural banks and the commercial banks to facilitate the growing credit demands for specific non-serial products production, storage, transportation and marketing initiatives in non-conservative agricultural regions, to deepen up and widen out the agricultural lending in keeping with the paradigm shift. 5.6.1 Limitation the cooperative sector upon which the entire poverty alleviation schemes of the initial post-independence era had been placed for assisting the rural poor had been hijacked by the less poor, landowners and allied political interests of the rural area, as a result of which they still cater to 30% of the credit needs of the rural society. This sector is beset with major weaknesses. But since there are no alternatives to cooperative strategy therefore with all its problems it continues to strive for better credit flow in the rural areas. The scheduled commercial banks though doing a yeoman service in the area of rural credit could tap only 5% of the small and marginal farmers and only 10% of their net bank credit went to the weaker sections of the rural population. This despite the fact that about 40% of rural credit is mostly microcredit and that too is Refina 11 said by Nabard. The regional rural banks which were specially created to cater to the needs of the rural poor, by 1992 only 23 RRBs out of a total of 196 RRBs were in the profit-making sustainable category, smacking of anti-professionalism which also seems to be cause of stagnation at K7% during 2002-2004 era. Nevertheless on account of certain corrective strengthening measures being taken in 2004,160 RRBs have registered profit expressions. While 90 RRBs are still in the red and are continuously accumulating losses, this process of strengthening has contributed to a thoroughly changed scenario for the profit-making 160 RRBs where the credit deposit ratio exceeds 40% while for the other 90 RRBs the credit deposit ratio is under 25%. Thus they are no longer sustainable and viable microcred 1T institutions. The foregoing analysis only amplifies the scarcity of viable credit institution of rural India. The situation has so developed on account of the state sponsoring of credit institutions, mixing welfare objectives with business traits, policy formulation not being based upon market operation of free play that is not being based upon the economic principle of competition, market price appropriate performance appraisal, and long-term innovative investment in credit productivity but on credit flow in rural areas on the grounds of charities, subsidies and vote bank consideration including lowering of bank rates, loan waiver and so politicized. 5.7 Let US sum up the role of Newell Credit is the most crucial aspect of rural development. 
rural credit hitherto had been the domain of the various money lending categories, since independence the cooperative credit structure gained in importance and it was linked with other aspects of rural development. Unfortunately the cooperatives started serving primarily the rural haves and the rural poor got neglected in the process, that was corrected to an extent by the nationalization of major commercial banks, by allocating the top P1-iority sector to agriculture and allied rural industries, to operationalize credit flow in the rural sector in a coordinated manner the lead district bank scheme for the districts was launched along with a broadening of the rural banking base in the shape of regional rural banks, smoothening out credit flow in bankless areas for the poorest of the poor, in the rural areas, to ensure better spatial distribution and sectorial disbursement of credit in mid-1995 the concept of microfinance on the pattern of Grameen group model gained currency in international arena as well as in India, which witnessed the proliferation of SHGs throughout the country spelling out success stories on being credit linked. This model became a runaway success especially with the all-women groups yet meeting the entire credit needs of the rural community needs further strengthening up of that paradigm shift that caused the microfinance SHG linkage, by appropriate policy formulation, capacity building and monitoring along with regulation and supervision. Despite these measures and initiatives a lot of ground has to be covered in the realm of rural development, as credit is the pivotal which rural societies develop. 5.8 Keywords Area Approach – Identifying the viable areas for opening up new banks Capital Distribution of Credit – Distribution of Finances on the Basis of Area Covered Sectoral Distribution of Credit – Distribution of Finances on the Basis of Sectors such as Agricultural, Cottage and Small-Scale Industries Saving and Thrift – Curtailing Expenditure to Accumulate Wealth for Depositing in Banks and Avoidance of Waste in the Use of Money Thank you, we will see you in the next video.